We all ask questions. Are eyebrows considered facial hair? I've always wondered, do vegetarians eat animal crackers? If a number two pencil is so popular, why is it still number two? Do bald people get dandruff? Why are power outages reported on TV? That makes no sense. But some questions are more meaningful than others. How do I handle all the stress in my life? How do I discover God's will for my life and live it out every day? I have a hard time dealing with disappointment. What does the Bible say I should do? How can I be the parent my kids need me to be and the one God wants me to be? What does the Bible say about dealing with difficult people? Because I know some. Are we actually living in the end times? What does that mean for me? So we turn to the one who has all the answers. We'll examine some of our biggest questions and discover God's best plan. Why? Because you asked for it. There we go. Okay, I'm back. We all ask questions. That's enough. Thank you. <laughs> well, listen, it's so good to go through this series. And last week we spoke about um, how we find our purpose. And uh, the most important question people ask at a survey, let me just explain what happened. We had an Easter Sunday. We had over 700 people. We, we gave them the opportunity to hand out surveys to over Easter Sunday. And pe- we had a tremendous response. And we, cal- we calculated them all together. And we found the number one question people ask was this, how do I reduce stress in my life? And so last week we spoke about that. So now you should be stress-free. Uh, if you'd like to catch up, you can go to cornerstonecheshire.com. I think it was a really, really important message, and I really do, because, you know, about connecting to God, connecting to a sustainable schedule, and connecting to others. And when we do that, I really believe that God is going to do a great work in our lives more and more and more. So I just want to encourage you with that this morning. So today, the second most popular question, which is really, I, I kind of found surprising, but it was this, how do I find the purpose of my life? How do I find the purpose of my life? There are a lot of people today that are just going through the road, just going through life, and they had dreams as children, and they had thoughts that maybe what they want to do when they get older. You know how you are as a kid, you'll dream, you'll put a Batman cape on and run around the house, and I know this from firsthand experience. Kids want to be this or the other. They want to be baseball players, soccer players, uh, surgeons, you name it. They have these great ideas, and they want to do great things, and then they go to school, then they go to college, and then they get their job, and they get married, and they have kids, and they have to pay the bills, and all of a sudden, uh, the bills take away the thrills, and it's like, I just got to pay the bills, and what can begin to happen is it becomes an act of survival. I got to take care of the family. I got to feed the mouths and do this and the other. And we start finding ourselves getting on this treadmill. And all of a sudden, a decade goes by. You're in your 20s and your 30s and your 40s. You wait a minute here. Kids are about ready to go to college. And what am I doing in my life? What's the purpose of all this? And you start, you ever hear the midlife crisis? Okay, if I ever buy a Trans Am and put chains around my neck. I remember this in the, in the, I had a friend of mine, his father, unfortunately, he went through a midlife crisis. He gave his life back to Christ. But back in the day, the Trans Am was it. He bought a Trans Am and, you know, started, left his wife and tried to find his way and, you know, hopping around and trying. A lot of people go through this midlife crisis because they're trying to find out why am I alive? I'm at halftime. I got to, you know, life is passing me by. That can happen. Or I remember being in the 20s when I was in my 20s I had a plan of everything how I wanted to be, and all of a sudden it all fell apart, thank God. But then I was like, God, what do you want from me now? And and trying to discover why I am alive. God, why am I here? Why am I here? It's so interesting that uh, Gallup Poll, they did a study, and this is what they found, uh, according to Gallup Poll this past year. It says, our happiness levels, this is kind of interesting, uh, 60% of all Americans today feel happy. A new study cautions that there's something much more important than happiness. You know what they said? Finding your purpose. And what they found out is that people who try just to pursue happiness never seem to get it. Because it says in the survey that people always want to take, I want to take, I want to take, I want to take. 
And you're always going for the next thing. And what can happen is this. As long as you continue to put something before you to pursue for the next goal. Okay, you got this goal. Now, if I do this, then I'll be happy. If I become a branch manager, I'll be happy. If I become an owner, I'll be happy. If I get married, I'll be happy. I'll be happy when I have kids. I'll be happy when the kids are gone. I'll be happy, you know, and you go on and on and on. I'll be happy when the church builds a building. I'll be happy. And you can run, run your life trying to go after the next goal. And what can happen, you can spend your entire life putting new goals goals ahead of yourself and running after it over and over and over and over and then you come to the realization wait a minute I've reached it but now it's left and there's something profoundly empty there's got to be more than life than just this and you know marriages sometimes their marriages are built upon the kids and they they live for the kids and everything about the kids and they don't invest in their relationship and their marriage and then the kids leave and like what do we have left in our marriage Folks, I don't want to get to the end of my life, how about you? And say, wait, what was the purpose of it all? And sometimes things we don't like to do, people don't like to get quiet sometimes. I keep myself busy. I think sometimes we're addicted to the pill called busy, the busy pill. We take it in droves, why? Because when we're busy, we don't have to think of why we're so busy. But my friends, God has a purpose and a plan for every single one of you. If you are alive today, God has a purpose and a plan. And the number two question was, how do I find purpose? I'm so glad I went through the struggle, because I did. God, why am I alive? Why am I here? What's the purpose? And I love what Jeremiah 29 11 says, and this is good news. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not disaster to give you a future and a hope. When you have no hope in your life, it's hard to go on. Hope is, you're, you're believing one day. It's hope is it's very much akin to faith. They're like, they're like kissing cousins, if you will. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Anyhow, but that's kind of what it's like. They're really close to each other, and, and they're part of each other. And so when you have no hope, it's hard to have joy for the future. It says, there are plans for good and disaster to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I want to, again, reiterate something. Because a lot of us have grown up with a legalistic mindset about God. That even in reading this verse, you think, oh, okay, if I get my act together, if I go after God, I go to church, I read my Bible, I do this, I help out the poor, then maybe God will show me. And you get this idea that you have to go after God, and, and God's, not, God's just not happy with you. His arms are folded, and he just wish we would get our act together. He's infuriated with it. No, that's not the truth. The truth is God loves us, and he wants us to discover his purpose for our lives. It's his great desire. But we're not going to find it looking other things. Only going to find our purpose when we look after God. Because everything else, every, everything else is secondary. And so what we're talking about here, folks, is an opportunity to know God. This is not another legalistic test list that you and I have to fill out and do. And if I do this, this, and the other, it's like, you know, it's like going to a lawyer's office and your spouse says, I want a divorce. And unless you do this, this, and the other, you're out of here. And they're trying to find a scapegoat to get rid of you. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a loving God who wants to have a relationship with you, who desires for you to find the purpose while he's designed you. And it's more of God's desire that you find that purpose than it is for you to find that purpose. And the enemy understands that. And we can spend our lives trying to be somebody else, trying to copy somebody else. You know, the sad thing is, as long as you try to copy someone else, you're only, the best you'll ever be is a facsimile of somebody else. If I try to be Rick Warren, I'll never be Rick Warren. If I try to be Joel Osteen, I'll never be Joel Osteen, but I'll smile a little more, <laughs> which I learned from him. Just kidding, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, if you follow after someone, it's good to follow someone and see their passion for God, but as long as you try to be like somebody else, you're only gonna be a facsimile, and you'll never be true to yourself or true to your design, and you'll live a life not being who you are. What God wants you to do is to find the divine version that God has given you. And this is part of the, the wonder and the purpose of life, is to find out why you are on this earth. This is what I have found. The only way you can find yourself is to lose yourself. 
When you lose yourself, you'll find yourself. And then when you find yourself, you have to lose it again and find God. Now, we'll get into that more in a few moments. But the Bible says this in Proverbs 21, 8, 29, 18. Where there's no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. Or Proverbs New Living Translation says, which does a good job. When people do not accept divine guidance... They run wild, but whoever obeys the law is joyful. Now, it seems like there's a lot of difference between the two, but really, without a divine vision of God. You see, the cast off restraint. When you have a goal and you're going after something, for example, if you're training for a triathlon, and you're trying to get your muscle mass up, you're doing swimming, running, bicycling, if you're training for this race and someone says to you, I want to go to Blackie's Hot Dogs for lunch. I want to go and I go four, and the lady will bring you four incredibly terrible hot dogs that are, taste amazing. And they're going to bring them to you with the incredible relish, and you're going to get off your plan. But you'd say, no, I can't do that. Why? Because I'm training for a triathlon that's taking place in six months. I have a goal. I have a purpose. I don't have time to waste doing that. But if you don't have that goal before you, then you can get distracted by things that frankly don't matter, and your health will never be good, and you will never be able to run that triathlon. See, an athlete understands that. An athlete would do what it has to he or she has to do, and it has a goal. Well, listen, the same thing happens in life. If you and I have a goal that's clear from God, we won't waste our time on things that frankly don't matter. It may not be sin. It may not be something terrible. But what it will do, it will waste your time, eat your time up, and you miss the opportunity that God has for you. So without a divine revelation, people cast off restraint. Why? Because purpose is so important. Next to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior, the second most important thing you need to do is find your purpose. You're thinking, I tried all my life. I don't know my purposes. Sometimes the purpose that you have is right next to you, and you don't even realize it because you're so busy trying to be somebody else's purpose instead of God's purpose. We'll be talking more about that in a little bit. Psalm 90, 12 says the following, teach us to realize the brevity of life so we may grow in wisdom. Life is short. When I was eight years old, the summer went on forever. Now that I'm a little bit older, the summer goes away in a breeze, right? I mean, you have about 90 days left to to Christmas, so you better get your shopping done. So, I mean, life goes faster and faster and faster, and the next thing you know, you look in the mirror and you're getting older, and you're like, what have I accomplished? Do you want to get to the end of your life and say, I didn't make a difference. I I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I don't want to be that way, do you? Or do you want to try to be somebody else for the rest of your life? It's almost like being in in high school or junior high where you're trying to wear wear the latest, greatest fashion. You're trying to be like everybody else. You're trying to fit in. You waste all your time. And you lose the fact of who you really, really are. Well, let me start with some good news today. God has a plan for everyone else this morning, hearing my voice, or even later on. He's got a plan. He has a purpose for every single person. Make no mistake about it. You are not an accident. You are here on purpose. You may be accidental parents, but no accidental children. God has a purpose. He has a plan for every single person. I was talking to someone this past week that was suicidal, not in this church. They want to end their life. Excuse me. It breaks my heart because the enemy has told them that their life is meaningless. And I said to him, there's a purpose why you're alive. God has a purpose for you. Everyone is precious to God. Everyone God has died for. And if you're alive today, you have a heartbeat in you. God has a purpose and a plan. Don't let the enemy say, I'm worthless person stabbing himself with pencils, something he wants to end his life. Young teenager. Kills me that I see that kind of nonsense happen. The enemy would try to rob you of your purpose. 
people cast off restraint without a heavenly vision. When you find out why you're alive, it gives you focus. It gives you a purpose. But there's so many mirages. There's so many sidetracks. There's so many distractions. And, and, and there's a lot of false gods that we can get a hold of and have a purpose and think we're on. There's other people, by the way, that are a lot worse off than the person that's suicidal. Because they think they found their purpose. And they're running after their own purposes. They're running after their own goals. But they're on a highway to hell. They're not going to God. They're going to destruction. They're following the ways of the world. And the Bible says, wide is the road that leads to hell. But narrow is the path. And so if the enemy can't get you through depression and anxiety and want to end your life, he'll get you chasing after something that's not even important. But what's the real purpose of our lives? God has an amazing plan for you. He really does. What did Jesus have to say to his disciples? In Mark 8, 34 through 37, he said this. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, when you read that, it's like, here we go again. This is why I don't like going to church. Because every time I go to church, I find out what I'm doing wrong and how I'm a scum and I have to change. If you read that from the vantage point of the law, that's what you see. If you read that from the vantage point of God's grace, it's a totally different story. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross and follow me. Listen, being selfish is horrible. Being selfish is eating at your very purpose of who you are. Being selfish literally robs you of true joy. It makes you jealous. It makes you anxious. It makes you upset. It puts you on a pathway. God has a better plan. So when the Bible says, leave your selfish ways, it's like, hey, you get to leave your selfish ways and become free. This is the opportunity we have. You must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross. Will to die. You don't live until you die. Until you come to the point where you realize your life is not your own and you say, I'm willing to die to myself, that's when you finally can resurrect to new and purposeful life. Why? Because you're designed by God for? That's right. You're here for God. You're not here for yourself. And as long as you live for yourself, you're going to be living a false life. When you learn why you're alive, while you're on the planet, it gives you incredible joy because it's beyond that. It's purpose, God's purpose, God's plan. Jesus says this, if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake of the good news, you'll, be, you'll save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? And so this is not just for those that want to end their life and they're depressed. No, these are people that are doing well and going after things. They're happy. They seem to have it all together, but they don't recognize that when the, when the call comes, when, the, when their life is over, there's going to come a judgment. And what, what have they accomplished? What have they done? What have they lived their life on? Was it all a waste? Was it all a waste? See, every life has a purpose, and the challenge is to find what it is. People have chased their purpose for decades. Decades. I thank God I went through it in my 20s before I met my wife. I went through it, folks. I didn't know why I was alive. I didn't even know if God existed for a period of time. It's like, why? What's the purpose of life? If God's not real, I don't want to, then why do I even bother doing this thing? I, let me just go out and have fun. Let me just make the, I began to wonder why I was alive. I became very introspective, and I began to examine different religions, and you can hear about it at, uh, at, at Church 101 for, uh, the first weekend of October. I told my testimony a little bit more, but I went through that process, and I thank God for the process, but you know why? Because it helps me identify people today. It was my dark night of the soul. Well, I questioned my very existence, and when I began to realize, when I began to say it's not about me, it's about God, it's the moment I began to find true freedom, and I will say to you, that I'm very satisfied with my life. I may not be where I want to be,
but I know I'm on the right path because I'm going after God. And you and everyone here today, if you'll take this message at heart, you can leave here today being satisfied knowing you're on the right path. You may not know all the answers, but you can get on the right path and have a life full of meaning. You see, you were made for this. Every life has a challenge. So what does the Bible say? It says, if you gain the whole world and use your soul, what, what good is it? How do we find purpose? Find God, and God wants to be found, and God will show you your purpose. The Bible says in Psalm 34, 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. God desires for you to have joy, but not at the expense of a lie. So God has designed all of us today. He's designed all of us for a purpose and a reason. And so what do we want to do? We want to find what that purpose is. But so many times, you and I try to be somebody else. We try to do the right thing the wrong way. And we find ourselves very, very frustrated. Here's a little humorous look of what happens when you do things the wrong way. Go ahead, Greg. Everything was made for a specific purpose. That's not what that's made for. 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 All right, I'm sorry. I, I, I know I showed it before, but I had to show it again. It's so good. Uh, not the cat part, okay. That wasn't a real cat, by the way, okay. But you can see in that video, as humorous as it is, what was happening in that video? They were using the wrong tools, even though they could work. It, it would work eating that spray spaghetti. It would work to, to do that in the pool, I suppose, but it's not the real way to do something. And so many times you and I run after the wrong things in the wrong way. Isn't it better to discover why you're alive? Isn't it better to discover your purpose? And, and, and this is what can happen. If, you just try, if, if your goal is to discover your purpose, it's the wrong goal. Let me say that again. If your goal is to discover your purpose, it's the wrong goal. Well, wait a minute, I thought your sermon's all about discovering your purpose. Yeah, it is. The way you discover your purpose is you discover God. When you discover God, you discover your purpose. I look what the great theologian said, thousand, I mean, how many years ago was that? Over a thousand years ago. Man's chief design is to love God and enjoy him forever. To love God and enjoy him forever. You know what, that's what it's all about in many ways. Well, how do we discover our purposes and how do we not waste our time with that? We're gonna look at a couple ways to do that, more practical, but I, I, it's so important first that we need to go after God and not go after other things. Things will never bring you where you need to go. And what's the most important thing? Delight yourself in God. You get, how do you delight yourself in God? Listen, God made all the stuff we like. He, he made beautiful sunsets. He made, he made all these wonderful things we love. And this is what the Bible has to say in, um, in Mark 12, 29. Jesus said this, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbors yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Again, here, I want you to look at that verse in the proper sequence, not from the sequence of legalism, of the law, but of grace. Love the Lord with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Why? Because you were designed by God to love God. From the very, very beginning, you're designed, and you'll never be what you're called to be without God. It just doesn't work. Why? Because we have God in us. We are designed to have God flowing through us, and if we don't have God flowing through us, we have the wrong thing flowing through us, and we end up doing damage to our emotions and to our relationships, and yes, even to our eternity, possibly. We're designed by God for God. 
We have to understand that. And the only way you're going to really know God is go after God. Well, how do I go after God? You go after God saying, God, I don't know how to go after you. <laughs> but I need you, God. The Bible says if you search me with all your heart, you will find me. I believe that. I love what it says in Psalm 138.8. The Lord will work out his plans for my life. For your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. Don't abandon me, for you made me. That's Psalm 138.8. The Lord will work out his plans for my life. God will work out his plans for your life. Your job is to go after God. God's job is to show you his plans. And this is the way it works. The moment I try to grow the church is the moment I lose it. The moment I go after God is when I get it. You know where I often get my sermons from? If I sit here tomorrow and say, I gotta do my sermon for Sunday, and I sit there, and I, I, nothing happens. But if I get away to a quiet place and I fellowship with God, I sing to him, I read the scriptures for my own, I don't read scriptures for my own ben for my benefit of the church, I just read for my own devotions. All of a sudden, I, I get in God's presence, and within 15 minutes, I get a whole series. Boom! And then all I have to do then is fill in the blanks. It's amazing. Why? Because when I go after him, he gives me everything else. If I go after try to be a good pastor, I'll mess it up. If I go after try to be a good husband, I'll mess it up. If I go after try to be a good father, I'll mess it up. But if I go after God and get connected to him, then he shows me how to be a good parent. He shows me how to be a good pa uh, pastor. He shows me how to be successful in this church. But the moment it becomes about trying to be successful like the other guy down the street or the other guy across the state or the country or try to be a facsimile of somebody else, that's the moment I really get anxious and get stressed out. But I says, you know what? It's about knowing God and then God shows me. It's beautiful. And you can do the same. You don't have to worry so much trying to do this, 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 and the other. Life is extremely simple. Love is simple. Sin is complicated. When you go after God, it, how simple can you get? Just go after me with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. You do those things, God's going to show you the plan for your life. Is he? Yes, he's going to do it. How do you know? Because his word is true. And millions of other believers have found their purposes we need, to look at, we need to look to people that have found their purpose. Not to copy them in their purpose, but copy what they did to find their purpose. How did Zacchaeus find his purpose? He gave it all away to Jesus, didn't he? He left his life behind. How did the disciples find their purpose? They were fishing. Jesus says, come follow me. And what did they do? They laid their nets down and they left everything behind and they went after God. Elisha, who was the Elijah came first, Elijah came second. When he threw his cloak on him, says, follow me, he burned his farming equipment, left everything, and went after the man of God. That's how you find God. You only really find God's purpose when you finally get rid of your purpose. You get rid of the purpose of trying to find purpose. <laughs> Let me say that again. If you get rid of the purpose of trying to find purpose, you'll find purpose. Why? By finding God. How simple is that? It's ridiculously simple. It's so simple, it's almost insulting. Can it be something deeper? No, it's not. It, actually, it's very deep. It's extremely deep, but very simple. You will never exhaust knowing God. You'll never exhaust knowing his presence, his power, and his purpose in your life. Never. But it's right before us. You don't have to do all these other things. Now, there's some things that we can do, which we'll share with. I love what it says here. God will work out his plans for my life. God will work it out. Our job's to go after him. His job's to show us the way to go. This is what happened. I mean, look at the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit led us here. We went here. And we see God leading. Jesus says, I do nothing unless I see the Father doing it first. He doesn't do his own plans. He always re relies upon God. Do we make plans? Of course we make plans. But make plans after God has shown you. I love what it says in Psalm 139, 14 through 17. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. <laughs> Some of you are saying, yeah, I'm married to one of those. Uh, Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. Why do we find so-called fetuses so important? Because it's God's handiwork. Millions of God's handiwork are being aborted. That's a problem. If you've, been involved, if you've been involved with that some way or another, there's forgiveness for you. But I need to mention that every life is precious. 
Verse 16, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. You see, God understands. He wove you. He made you. He know what works. Don't try, stop trying to be somebody else. I heard a story before. It's a good story. I heard about a, an eagle egg that got caught in a chicken yard. Okay, <laughs> some of you have chickens. There's a gentleman in our church that has chickens. He gives us eggs on the Wednesday morning Bible study. Uh, anyhow, but these little chickens, chickens are great to eat. Okay, they're great to eat. And they're good for eggs. But you don't want to be a chicken. What is an eagle? Eagle is one of the most majestic birds in the world. Fantastic. But imagine this little, this little eagle egg hatches and hangs out with a bunch of chickens. And it's always frustrated that it can never be Colonel Sanders' best recipe. And it realizes... That, you know, it's saying, I, I, there's more for life than this. Of course there is. And can you imagine a little, a little uh, eagle that's saying, I'll, you, and you see an eagle fly by, you'll never get me in one of those. We're designed to be eagles and soar. We're not designed to be chickens. God has a purpose. He has a plan for our lives. And he's laid it out, you know. So, uh, understanding, finding your purpose is a process. Understand, it's a process. You see, if, you're, if you do what God's asked you to do right here, he'll just show you sometimes one day at a time. But sh do what he showed you each day, and the next day he'll show you. It's so simple. Again, another scripture verse you'll hear me say over and over and over, Matthew 6, right? Seek what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worry of itself. Sufficient is each day. So if we take it one day at a time, God will show us more and show us more and show us more. It's like being in the dark and you have a flashlight. All you have is a little bit, but it's enough to get you there. As you are trusting God with the revelation he's given you, he'll give you more revelation. But why would God want to show you more revelation if you're not paying attention to the revelation you have? Too much is given, much is required. And God does not want to judge us. He doesn't. He, he, so when we listen to the revelation he's given us, if right now you're a student, then be the best student you can. But I, I'm called to do this. I'm called to start my own company. I'm working in the mailroom. Yeah? Well, there's many, many people that started in the mailroom that became a CEO of a company by working hard, by acting like it was their company as far as were hard work, coming early, leaving late, putting in their best. It's people like that that make a way. The gentleman from Best Buy, I know the company's not doing very well right now, but nevertheless, he started out from the very beginning as a clerk, started off in the mailroom, and he worked his way. He treated it like it was his own company. He's, a, actually, he's actually a believer. And what happened was he eventually became a CEO. Why? Because he worked hard. He said, I'm going to make this, this, this day the Lord has given me right now. The purpose of my life right now is to be the best employer, employee at Best Buy I can be. And as a result of doing that, God can continue to advance him. Well, how about Philip and Stephen? Oh, I want to be a great apostle. I want to be a great evangelist, just like Peter and those guys. And what are they doing? They're waiting tables. They're deacons. You know what deacon means, by the way? Servant. People, oh, I'm a deacon. Oh, really? It means you're a servant. And as they serve tables, what happened? The next thing you know, they're evangelists. What God has given you, do it to him and unto him with everything that you have. This is how we do it. How do we do that? Well, think about Moses, for example. Moses had a purpose, didn't he? Moses was born to be a deliverer. It's something that God put in his heart. He saved him from being killed by putting him in that basket, raised in Pharaoh's household, the Pharaoh's daughter, grew up, very popular, had the greatest education possible. But all we know is at the age of 40, he saw that his people were being persecuted and he didn't like it. He wanted to find deliverance. It's something that God put in him. It was a good desire. But what happened? It was premature and he did it in his own way. And what happened? He killed an Egyptian man. The next day, Israelites, he saw them fighting. Hey, don't be fighting that way. Are you going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian? He's like, oh, I'm in trouble. He became a fugitive at the age of 40. The age when you really begin to reach your goals. You're finally, you're an adult now. You've gone through the 20s and 30s or 40s. You're trying to find your, your career path. You're beginning to really excel here. And he's ready to do it. He has a desire to deliver people. It's something that God has given him. And he takes matters in his own hands. He has a desire. God given. God bred. God infused in his very being. And he tries to do it without asking God. What happens? He's a fugitive. And where does it go? To the backside of a desert. From the palace to a desert. 
Egyptians, it says, hated shepherds. They thought they were low lowlifes. And what did Moses do for 40 years? The first 40 years, he was the Ivy League, Harvard educated, whatever. He was the great guy. And, and it was fantastic. The second 40 years, he was a filthy shepherd living on the backside of a desert thinking, this is just my lot in life. This is, I guess this is what I'm doing. But the Bible says that we, as he was walking, he saw a bush and it was burning. And Moses said, let me see what's going on here. I have a suspicion that Moses came to terms with himself. Okay, I guess I'm not going to be deliverer. And what happened? I think he was going after God. I do. And God showed himself to him. And he thought, I just wasted 40 years of my life. And it's an amazing calling. I don't have time to go through today. But God basically called him to take over and to be a deliverer. And little did he know that the 40 years spent in the desert would teach him how to lead the Israelites through the desert. Dealing with sheep is a good practice to know how to deal with people. <laughs> and so that's exactly what began to happen. Moses learned through that. Maybe some of you have taken some detours and you don't recognize those detours might be part of God's plan for your life. Now, you may have made mistakes. God works all things together for those that love him and accord according to his purposes. It doesn't mean he causes all things to happen, but he can cause even your mistakes and he can turn it around and make it something good. And this is what happened to Moses. How about Joseph? Had tremendous dreams as a young man. I'm going to be somebody one day. I'm going to be someone great. And he was foolish, unfortunately, to share his dreams with his brothers. His brothers were jealous. Oh, here comes that dreamer. You know the story. Gets thrown into a pit, sold and to be a slave. And yet all that preparation learning the Egyptian language, learning the culture, learning the political system. All that gave him the ability to become one of the greatest leaders that the world has ever seen. Well, how do I find what the Lord has for me? Well, very simple. Connect to God. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. How do I do that? Well, start identifying what's important to you. What's your passion? He'll give you the desires of your heart. Do you realize Moses had a passion, what? To deliver the people of his own people. But what was the problem? The problem was he tried to do it his own way. Some of you have desires to start companies. That's a great thing. Some of you have desires to, to, to have a family and start a family. That's a great thing. Some of you have desires to sing and be in the worship team. And that's a great thing unless you can't sing. You can, live in a, you can live in a bad way too. You ever seen American Idol tryouts? These people think they can sing, they can't sing. Well, how do you find out? Well, we, we just happen to have a class today after the second service at 12.30 at Sal's house, right the little house over there. It's called Discovery 301. And we give you a personality profile test, spiritual gifts test, passions test, and it will kind of help you to begin to know what path to run on just a little bit. You see, it's God says one of the designs of our church is to help you find God, find your purpose, and be released in that purpose. That's what we want to see happen. And many of you have a purpose already. God has put it in you. You have a desire. What's your passion? What 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 do you do that just I got it? I love doing that. Some people say I love playing golf. Okay, that's good. Maybe you can open a golf course. I don't know. But develop a statement. Develop a purpose. Why am I here, God? I remember what happened to me. I said, God, what's my purpose? And I, mean, I, I said, I don't know what it is, but I just love talking about, I love explaining things to the people, and I, people are important to me. I want to help people, and I like explaining things. That's what I figured out. And then all I began to figure out, I, can become a, I don't want to become a pastor. That's what my dad went through. So that process of doing that, started setting up chairs and helping people, and wasn't even hired at a church, and I, I worked like I owned a church. I worked like I was the pastor. If I saw a toilet paper thing empty, I'd change it. If I saw salt in the parking lot, I'd throw salt, on, I'd throw salt on it. If I saw ice, I'd throw salt on it. I worked hard, and I acted like it was mine. And as I did that, God opened the door. I wasn't looking for this church. I was happy being an assistant pastor. But I was going after God, and this our church opened up. I, really did, I said, you know, I'm really happy where I'm at. You see, as you seek God and go after the passion He's given you, He's given you passions. Those passions are God-given, the desires of your heart. Let God begin to bring it out. Look what it says here, 2 Timothy. What did the Apostle Paul do? He said, I fought 
the good fight. I have finished the race. I've remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness for which the Lord of righteous judge will give me on that day. And the prize is not necessary for me, but those who all eagerly look for his forward. I don't know about you, but I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to end one more scripture here today. I'm going to do a little, I'm going to show you a little video and then we're going to end it. This is what it says, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. You can follow me, appreciate it. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already we have through Christ Jesus. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if the person has any value. If the work survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through the wall of flames. What is that all about? Well, everything you do is gonna be judged one day. Real simple, everything you do for yourself is gonna burn up. You can spend your whole life, I can spend my whole life pastoring a church, growing, a, starting a college, starting a university, uh, getting a New York Times bestseller, have my own TV program on Fox News and CNN, whatever, and I can be seen as a, a counsel to presidents, but if it's all about me, I may help millions of people, but when I go to heaven, God's gonna go, you know what? Everything you did was for your own ego. You're saved, but you come in. Meanwhile, there's a janitor that works at the high school here in Cheshire who loves God, who does his work unto the Lord and polishes the floors, is a blessing to the students and the teachers. And he's gonna have a phenomenal reward because he's involved with this church and he does the best he can. And the great evangelist, pastor, teacher, entrepreneur will not be rewarded much, but the person that did what he was supposed to do will be rewarded much. That's good to know. God's not gonna judge you based on somebody else. He's gonna judge you and reward you based upon what he's given you and how you respond to it. I don't know about you, do you wanna waste your life? I don't. One day you're gonna to have to give an account for your life. I'm gonna ask that this the band would just quiet down for one moment. I wanna show you, I normally don't do this. It's a little bit different, but I wanna show you this. Uh, this morning, I wasn't even planning to do this, but this song just came in my head this morning. And I wanna share it with you. And uh, a couple of years ago, I lost my voice for about a week and it really scared me. I was thinking, oh my gosh. I can't live without talking. <laughs> and this, this song really touched me. I want you to listen to it and follow along. How many of us are going through the motions? Just going through life and just doing whatever and not having a passion. I, I, I can't think of anything worse than, but I said not having my salvation, to go through my life and saying, you mean everything I did meant nothing? I mean, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I gave my life to Christ, but it was all about me. Is that the way you want to live your life? Just collecting things and dying? I don't know about you. I don't want to be that way, do you? I want passion. You were made for passion. You were made to be passionately in love with God because God desires to utilize you and to have you become what you're called to be. Let's pray. Father, we don't want to go through the motions anymore. We don't just want to live our life and just go through the motions and just do this and the other and lose the reason why we're alive. God, every person here and hearing my voice is here for a purpose and for a reason. And that reason is to love you and to know you and to enjoy you forever. Father, that's the ultimate goal we have as human beings because that goal is beyond this life and goes on for eternity. Father, I pray you'd stir every single person here this morning, hearing my voice or later on, in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Who are you living for? Are you living for yourself or are you living for God? Are you living for your own thing? Are you trying to find happiness? And are you using God as a mechanism to find happiness instead of finding God and, tr and truly finding happiness? If you were to die here today, how many of you would say, God could say, welcome into my life today. Are you on that highway to hell that is so wide and so, the whole world's on it? 
or are you on a narrow path? And some of you are saying to pastor today, I want to give my life to him. I'm tired of living it my own way. I've run away from God or I've never given my life to God. I'm just playing church. With every head bowed, just say just quickly so I can know how to pray for you. Just quickly put your hands up. Say, Pastor, that's me. I'm tired of living just for myself. I want to give my life to him 100%. I'm tired of this half stuff. Anyone this morning say, Pastor, that's me. Just real quick. Just raise your hand. Say, Pastor, that's me. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, let's pray that right now. For Lord Jesus, we thank you that we were designed by you and for you. Lord, we give our life to you today. We ask you to forgive us of all of our sins, both known and unknown. And we choose to make you Lord and Savior of our lives today. Come, take my life. It is not mine, it is yours. I give it to you today in Jesus' name. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit. If you've prayed that prayer, you're in the beginning. And for the rest of us here today, I want to hear him saying that, that, that day, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to pass through the fire and that whatever you do for God and, and for other people, you do whatever you do for God lasts forever. Whatever you do for yourself, it's just for yourself. And some of us have been living just for ourselves. Let's pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to forgive us for living for ourselves, thinking that things will fulfill us. We recognize now, we're reminded today that our true purpose is not found in things and accomplishments. It's found in you, Jesus. And you are the reason we live and you're the reason we are. And we recognize that when we find you, we find purpose. When we find purpose, we find life. We find passion. And Father, I pray in the coming days and weeks that we would begin to more and more, Cornerstone and our family and our growing family that you're sending us, would continue to find the purpose of why we're alive. That we could take our place and try to, instead of trying to be somebody else, we would be the person you created us to be. And that we'd be beautifully burning fire of love and passion for you. Lord, I pray for a passion to well up in each of us as we go after you. We thank you. It's very simple, Lord God. We go after you with everything we have, and then you will begin to give us the desires of our heart, and we'll find our passion and our purpose. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand as we have a closing song today. I'm going to ask the worship team, uh, I'm going to ask the uh, prayer team to make their way up. If you have anything, any prayers at all, we'd love to have you come for prayer. If you want a little help today, come to 301. we got extra spaces at 1230 to help, give you, help you find your passion. God bless you. Let Christ be your everything. You're dismissed. God bless you.